Hello everyone, I welcome all of you on behalf of EduDeka in our Docker and Kubernetes webinar. Okay, in this webinar, we are mainly going to talk about what exactly Docker is and what exactly Kubernetes is all about. Okay, mainly they are used for containerizing your applications, but uh, what exactly is Docker and what exactly is Kubernetes? We'll see that in our webinar today. Okay, so this is going to be the high level agenda for our today's webinar. Like what are containers, introduction to Docker, introduction to Kubernetes, some Kubernetes components we'll talk about. Benefits of Kubernetes, preparing the environment, we'll see a case study and then we'll see some hands-on. We'll try to run some commands, we'll try to deploy some applications onto Docker and Kubernetes. Okay. So let's start guys, what are containers? Okay. So what are basically your containers? So for example, Let's suppose I have, I want to deploy an application. Okay. This is a server. Okay. And onto this particular server, I install an operating system. And on top of that operating system, I want to deploy an application. So what I will do, I will simply go and install the application on that. For example, it can be a database or it can be a web server. Okay. That is what we normally do. We create a machine, we create a server. On that server, we simply go and deploy the application. Okay. Once the application is deployed, we start using it. Okay. So this is what we normally do. Now this server can be a virtual machine or this can be a physical machine. Does not matter. But we require some computing machine on which I can run my application. This is one of the most frequently or you call it as a traditional way of running application. Okay. We still use this, but yes, this is, this way is being working from last ages. Okay. Like we just have a, we just have a server created and once the server is created, operating system is installed. After that, we simply go and deploy the application like we do it on Windows. Like I have deployed so many applications, Notepad, uh, Microsoft Edge, Zoom, Putty, Chrome. These are different applications running on a Windows operating system. But this particular model, this particular architecture has some drawbacks. The drawbacks with this particular model are that this particular application may be consuming resources less than what you have assigned. Like for example, you have assigned this particular VM, okay, around four CPUs and around 16 GB, okay. And this particular application is only consuming around four GB of RAM and two CPUs. Okay, so that is way less than what you have assigned. Okay, rest of the resources are actually underutilized. So that is one drawback of running an application directly on the server. Apart from that, to run this application, you require a full copy of the operating system. You need to install an OS first. Okay, so for that, you need to have a sysadmin team who is going to take care of the operating system. Okay, who is going to install it, who is going to upgrade it, who is going to patch it, who is going to make any kind of vulnerability scanning onto it. So all these things has to be done by a sysadmin team. Again, having a sysadmin team for maintaining an OS is a bit costly. Okay, uh, because you have to hire people for managing the operating system. Apart from that, patching activity, maintenance activity also requires some downtime. Your application may be down when all these activities are happening. So yes, running a full OS for the one application is costly. Okay. Under utilization of resources can happen. A full OS for a sysadmin team is required. And last but not the least, the application that you are running on the server. Okay. Is not portable. It is not hundred percent portable. For example, there's some other person in your team. Okay. And that particular person is trying to deploy the same application on his server. And for him, this may not be working. Why? Because this application has some dependencies which are fulfilled on your machine. For example, this application requires some Java version 11 or Java version 12. And on this server, on this particular machine, it is not running over there. Okay. Then then this particular application might not work. It may not start because dependencies are not getting fulfilled. So anything that you are running on a VM is not hundred percent portable. It, it can be ported only when all the dependencies are meeting. 
Okay, so that is another drawback when we are going with the virtual machines. Okay, apart from that, creating these VMs is time consuming. Like if I, have, if, I, if I remember my olden days when I was started, when I was also working as a sysadmin, a backup admin as a sysadmin, for creating just one virtual machine, it took us around two to three hours. Like we need to create a VM, then we need to install an operating system, we need to configure the IP addresses, we need to install any antivirus or anything, whatever we have to do. We have to do it end to end. So it take around two to three hours for deploying one complete server. Okay. Nowadays we have template mechanisms and it is more faster. We are on the cloud now. So life is more easy or with just one click, we are just good to go and our machines are deployed. So that is how it goes nowadays. But yes, creating VM is again, a heavyweight operation. So that is why we always try to reduce our cost. Apart from reducing cost, we need to reduce the time as well for deploying application and how this can be done. So this can be done when you go and share this particular OS among multiple applications. Like on a single piece of OS, you go and deploy multiple applications. That is one of the more efficient way and more easy way, more uh, basically uh, you are reducing your cost as well with that. Why? Because one server, one computing device for multiple application. But again, like let's suppose if you are running two applications on a single server, okay. So there can be conflict among them as well. Like you are having an operating system on this. And I want to deploy an application NGINX. NGINX is basically a web server. And I want to deploy HTTPD, which is also acting as a web server. Both of them are web services. I want to deploy them on the same operating system. So this will not work. Okay. I want to deploy multiple applications on the same OS, but the problem here is like, if I go and deploy similar kind of application on the same OS, it is not going to work. Reason there will be conflict. There will be network conflict. Okay. Networking will conflict over there. Why? Because this application requires port 80. This application requires also port 80. Okay. So if let's suppose you install this first, it is running and then you're trying to install this. It is not running. Why? Because port 80 is already in use. It will say port 80 already binded. So that is the problem. Okay. So how we can overcome these problems? Like I want to share this OS among multiple applications, but OS, uh, these OS is shared, but application should be running isolated. There must be isolation between the applications, although they are on the same server. So how we can create that isolation okay, for the applications? That is what we want. And that is what containerization is all about. Isolating your applications running on the same server. Okay. So to give you a picture about that, to give you an idea about that, what exactly containerization is all about is, okay, you have a machine, you have your server. On this server, you install the operating system. We install the operating system. Okay. After installing operating system, okay, we operating system basically has kernel. Every OS has two features. One is a kernel and the other one is a shell. Shell is for user interaction. Kernel is for hardware interaction. This is for interacting with hardware and this is for interacting with user. Like these are the two important components of any operating system. Okay. Now in the kernel, kernel has a feature called as namespaces. Okay. Namespaces. This, this is one of the important feature of operating system kernel is every kernel has this feature. And what is important about this is like, for example, I want to deploy an application as a container. Okay. I want to deploy it as a container. So what I will do is I will simply create a kernel namespace. I will create a namespace, a kernel namespace, and I will deploy my application over here. Okay. And what this namespace is all about, this namespace basically gives you the isolation for your processes, for your set of files that they're using for network isolation, user isolation, all of the things are isolated. Like this namespace will have its own name. Okay. It will have its own IP address. Okay. It will have its own processes. It will have its own set of files, own set of mount points, everything different. 
on the same OS, if I use this feature, I can create another namespace, which will have its own name, own IP, own processes, own set of files. And I will, I can run another application inside this namespace. Similarly, I can create multiple namespaces on the same machine where I can run the application. So ultimately, I am running multiple applications on the same machine. On the same machine, I'm running multiple apps, but those apps are isolated from each other. Okay. Those, all the applications are all isolated. Okay. They cannot see each other. They can see each other using the net network, using the IP. They can see each other, but they cannot see what the other application, I, uh, what the other application processes are, what the other application files are. So this isolation is nothing but your container. It is your container. Okay. And Docker is basically a tool that helps you in creating container that helps you in basically creating these namespaces. Okay. So Docker is a tool that utilizes the feature of kernel namespaces to create isolated environment where you can easily run your applications. Okay. So what exactly, how do we do that? Okay. So let's suppose you have this machine over here. Okay. You have a OS installed on top of this. After you install OS, you install Docker. Okay. Docker is basically a tool that is used to create containers. Okay. And Docker utilizes the feature of this OS. That is the kernel namespaces kernel namespaces. This feature is utilized by Docker to create the isolated environments in which you are running your applications. And these isolated environment are nothing but your container. This is a container. This is a container. In short, this is a kernel namespace. This is actually a kernel namespace. It's a kernel namespace. So Docker is an implementation of kernel namespaces. Okay. Those are called as your containers. Now, why do we require these? Why do we require this? The first thing is my cost is reduced over there. You can check. Okay. Like earlier I was using one application, one server. And on that particular server, I was just having one application running. Okay. Like a database server, a web server, a Kafka server, another database server. So like these are multiple applications which were running on this respective servers. Now on a single server, I've deployed application in their own isolated environments. So this reduces my cost because I have to use limited machines. The number of machines goes down. Okay. The OS, the OS that I need to manage is only on this particular machine. Uh, Earlier, you need to manage multiple machines or so multiple operating systems. Again, a bigger sysadmin team is required to manage all these things. Now you can work with few sysadmins to manage this OS. Cost and portable, like this application plus its dependencies are all running in this container. You can simply take this container and run it on some other machine. It will flawlessly be running because a container has the application. And in those, in that container application, along with the application dependencies are also there. So containers are easily portable. It reduces my cost and time to create the container is quite less because you don't require the OS on a single OS. All the containers are running. These, all the containers are sharing the same kernel. Okay. So yes, you don't need to create a VM then. So that time is consumed. Okay. Because when you are creating a VM, you are installing OS. OS means the kernel as well. So that time is reduced and the application deployment time is more faster, more quicker. So this is why we require containerization. This is why we require Docker over here. Okay. But we have put our applications into container over here. My life is good. Time is saved. But application deployment is faster. Cost is reduced. Okay. That's good. Applications are portable from one machine. I can take the application to another machine. That's also good, but there are another challenges with this. Okay. 
So what are the challenges basically with Docker? Let's talk about that. Okay. So for example, okay, let's suppose this is my machine over here. On this, I have installed the operating system. On top of that, I've installed Docker. And this Docker has created the, uh, you have created some containers over there, which are running their own applications. Inside them, you are running your applications. Okay. Now, my life is good till here. But let's suppose one day this OS crashes. It crashed. Or this server went offline. Okay. Then what? Then basically what? Then what will happen to these containers? What is going to happen to these? These all containers, these all application will die. Definitely they are going to be offline. Okay. So they all will die. And I'm out of production. That is one big challenge in this architecture is. Machine can go offline. We are running at a single point of failure. This OS is a single point of failure, SPOF. Let's see. Let's talk about one more drawback over here. Okay, let's suppose this particular machine is all up and running. Okay, that there's no failure in that. I created one more machine. Okay, where I've installed the operating system over here. I've installed Docker over there. And on top of that, I'm running some containers, some application over here, some application over here. Now, as these containers are on the same machine, they can easily talk to each other. They can easily talk to each other. There's no problem in that. But let's suppose if I want to communicate this container with this container, if I want to have a communication between these two containers, then that is a problem. Okay. Because container has its own private IP, which is non-routable. Okay. Non-routable to outside world. Like within the VM, this IP can be reachable. Like if, if I try to ping this IP, from this machine or from this container, it is reachable, this private IP. But if I try to reach this private IP from here, it's not reachable. This IP is not reachable. So how I can make my solution scalable? Like let's suppose if this OS, the problem here is let's suppose the CPU and the memory utilization on this OS is very high. I have created another machine for load sharing. I've created one more machine for load sharing. I've created some containers on this machine, but ultimately I want this container and this container to talk these two containers to talk to each other, how they will talk to each other. If they are on their own private IP, which is non routable outside. So that's a problem communication problem. My solution is non scalable. I have to stay on a single machine, but if I stay on a single machine, it's a single point of failure. I cannot use that in production. That's a problem. So now how to overcome these problems? That is the question to overcome these problems. Okay. We are good with containers. We have to run containers. We have to deploy our application using containers only, but using Docker containers gives you single point of failure. Or if you are creating another Docker host, you are running some more containers on other machine. Then you cannot communicate between the containers, which are sitting into two different machines. There are mechanisms. You can do port forwarding for containers. There are, but port forwarding is an insecure way, which nobody wants. Okay. Like for example, you're running your database as a container. You will be doing port forwarding for your database. You are exposing your database to the outside world, which nobody wants. Nobody wants to expose their data. Data is critical. Okay. So now the question here is how we can overcome these problems with container to overcome these problems. We require a container orchestrator, a container orchestrator is required over here. Okay. And I give you some of the basic example of container orchestrators like Kubernetes. Okay. We have Docker swarm. Okay. We have Apache mesosphere. These are different, different, uh, your container orchestrators and container orchestrator basically solves our problem. How let's talk about that. Let's first see how my problems are going to get solved over here. Okay. So for example, this is a machine. Okay. This is my machine. Number one, 
okay on which i've installed the os okay on which docker is also running okay now i have another machine over here okay this is my machine number 2 with a uh, os installed with docker running on top of it and then i have let's suppose one more machine over here okay this is my third machine over here with operating system installed and docker on top of it okay now this is machine number 1 this is machine number 2 this is my machine number 3 okay now when you are deploying a container orchestrator be it a kubernetes cluster be it a kubernetes docker swarm cluster or the apache mesosphere cluster cluster means a group of machines okay so when you are deploying a container orchestrator what the orchestrator what is the main job of the orchestrator is the main job of the orchestrator is to create a private network between these machines that you are going to make a part of the cluster for example you are going to deploy a kubernetes cluster okay you are going to deploy a kubernetes cluster okay so that particular kubernetes cluster or docker swarm cluster you will be having multiple machines now when you deploy that orchestrator the orchestrator will first go and deploy a network it will go and deploy a you can call it as a container network or the overlay network or the cluster network one and the same thing it is going to deploy a network which is also called as your container network okay it is going to deploy a container network okay so all the containers that you are going to create let's suppose container number 1 container number 2 container number 3 which are running on different different machines they will start taking the ip from this network okay so what is a container orchestrator container orchestrator is a container clustering technology okay this is the primary use of using a this is the primary feature of use of a orchestrator the first or the main feature why we require orchestrator is to get a network to make my solution scalable like i can have 3 4 5 6 7 8 10 100 machines okay and on those 100 machines i'm deploying containers now my container can can go on machine number 1 2 10 20 100 which will machine the container goes my containers should be able to talk to each other with the containers on the other nodes on the other machines you call this as a machine you call this as a node one and the same thing okay so kubernetes docker swarm apache mesosphere what are all all these these are container orchestrators and the main job or the main responsibility of these orchestrators to create a network between machines this this network is not for the vms no this network is not for the vms this is for your containers okay now let's suppose now this solves actually my problem of communication yes how does it solves my problem now container 1 and container 2 can talk to each other yes because they are going to be take the ip from the same private network they are they are going to take the ip from the same network yes it solves my problem of communication okay now the container can sit on any machine does not matter they can easily communicate apart from that orchestrators have inbuilt controlling mechanism they have inbuilt control mechanisms that is their secondary responsibility okay what that control mechanism means is for example let's suppose if this machine number 1 crashes machine number 1 is offline if machine number 1 is offline container number 1 will also be offline okay so automatically the orchestrator knows what to do with the failed container in that particular case okay kubernetes or any orchestrator will simply go and recreate the container on some other machine and it will take the ip from the same network because they have inbuilt control mechanisms that is what orchestrator is all about that is the secondary feature why we require orchestrator okay to provide you controlling of containers to provide you 
fault tolerance for your containers. Let's suppose this container is very critical. I want to keep this container in high availability. I require the HA for this. I can do that. I want to have multiple copies of this container. I can do that. Like I can create a C3 container over here. Connect to the same network. And I can create a C3 network over there. C3 container over there. Connect to the same network. Same container. Same application in high availability. Let's suppose machine number one crashed. This container is also crashed. Okay. But I can still access my application from these two containers. Yes. High availability. So to provide the high availability and the fault tolerance, basically high availability and fault tolerance, we require orchestrators. We require Kubernetes, we require Docker Swarm or Apache Mesosphere. These are the three well-known orchestrators available in the market. Okay. Out of which Kubernetes, okay, short form also called as Kates, is very widely used. Okay, uh, why it is called as Kates? You can see that here. You can see the spelling of Kubernetes, and it starts with the letter K. Okay, end with the letter S. Between the K and S, you have total eight letters, eight characters. You can count it up. U B E R N E T E. So that's why the first character number eight and then S. Short form for Kubernetes, Kates. Okay, so Kubernetes is an orchestrator which was developed by Google. Okay, Docker will not go to these here. Okay, but Docker Swarm is developed by Docker. Okay, Docker Inc. And Apache Mesosphere was developed by Apache, Apache Foundation. Okay, so this was developed by Google in the year 2009 and in year 2013. This was donated by Google to CNCF. CNCF stands for your Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Okay, CNCF is basically a open, a community basically that manages your projects which are open source, all the open source projects. So CNCF is basically a community that have developers sitting across the globe and those developers are contributing to the projects of CNCF. Kubernetes is one of the project managed by CNCF. Okay, we have not many other projects managed by CNCF like Prometheus, Calico. Okay, so these are also some well-known projects managed by CNCF. Okay, so as Google donated this to CNCF in the year 2013, okay, it became open source. It became open source. Open source means no licensing required. The source code is freely available on website, on GitHub. Source code is completely available there. Anyone can go and check it out. Okay. No licensing required. No vendor lock-in. You don't need to contact any vendor to deploy this. So that is what open source is. Okay. It was, it started in the year 2009. And from the year 9 to 13, this was used as an internal project by Google. World was not knowing about it. Then in the year 2013, it, Google donated the project to CNCF. And it became open source. It became, it completely became open source and Kubernetes is developed in Golang. Go stands for your Google language. Okay. Google language, Golang. So Google used their own language to uh, just uh, develop Kubernetes. Okay. There are lot many flavors also of Kubernetes available in the market. You might have heard about lot many flavors. Like if you have worked on Amazon AWS, you would have heard EKS, Elastic Kubernetes Services. It's a flavor of Kubernetes. AKS, if you have worked on Azure, Azure Kubernetes Services. If you have worked upon uh, Google Cloud, GKE, Google Kubernetes Engine. Okay, that's a flavor of uh, your Kubernetes. Kubernetes is all open source. But there are different different vendors which are providing Kubernetes as a service. Okay. OpenShift, Red Hat, OpenShift. If you have heard this name, very popular orchestrator. But that is also Kubernetes, Red Hat, OpenShift. Okay. Or Rancher Kubernetes Engine, Mirantis Kubernetes Engine. 
these all are your flavors of kubernetes kubernetes is open source like your linux operating system linux is open source but you have flavors for that centos red hat linux ubuntu suse linux hp linux fedora linux all these are flavors of linux same way kubernetes is all open source and these are different different flavors these are different different vendors who are providing kubernetes as a service okay now these are your cloud services these uh, the red open shift is on prem ranchal melantis are on prem kubernetes clusters okay you can deploy kubernetes on prem or on cloud any ways it is possible okay so this is what kubernetes is all about okay and in kubernetes we will be now deploying some applications we'll see how to deploy some applications into kubernetes how to run some application into containers as a pod okay let's go and see those thing over there okay so to start off with a small demo over there what i have did is on my gcp cloud i am using gke google kubernetes engine and on this cluster i have two vms that are going to be a part of my kubernetes cluster okay and i will simply go and deploy the containers basically in kubernetes we don't call it as containers we call it as pods okay we deploy our application in containers yes that's true application will be running as a container but in kubernetes if you are talking specifically to towards kubernetes in kubernetes the containers run within the pods the containers are running within the pods okay so in kubernetes manages the pod which in turn is your application only okay so let's go and see how do we create it okay but before that let me give you a quick tour of my cluster okay let me take you to my cloud shell you can see this is my cloud shell let me close this uh, so my cluster is running see i have a two node cluster i will show you that cluster no need to worry i will give you the command as well okay so right now you can see over there on my gcp terminal kubernetes engine if i click here okay i go here and you will see i'm running a kubernetes cluster of two nodes see uh, the name of the cluster is hello cluster okay that is what the name of the cluster is and this particular cluster has two nodes okay each node has two cpu 4 gb so two node is total four cpus 8 gb okay you want to see both the machines the both the machines are present here on my compute you can see i have a cluster created with two machines and both the machines are part of my computing okay so these are the two machines that are part of my kubernetes cluster okay now how i have created this cluster is you can create it using the ui okay that's also easy like do some next 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 okay like you go here and you want to create a cluster create and just fill in all the information how many machines you want what is the flavor of the machine okay in which region which zone all these things it will give you that over there okay you can just give a complete scenario over there like what exactly you want okay but i will give you a basic command as well that is more easy to deploy okay like for example i want to i have deployed it using command line i find it more easier rather than doing it on the ui so what i did is i have opened up my cloud shell over there you can see the cloud shell my google cloud shell is opening up so every cloud provider provides a cloud shell okay every cloud provider does that okay so in built cloud shell this cloud shell is for running any commands to interact with gcp i want to run some commands i don't like ui i want to run some commands then we do this okay so i open this in a new window click here open a new window you can see that it is opening up in a new window and i can close it from here i can close this okay now what i have did is i have simply ran this particular command to create a cluster okay g cloud container clusters create the name of the cluster okay number of nodes is equal to 2 this is what i have done but before doing this i have also ran some commands over there like uh, first of all i have set my project like i am in a gcp see this is my project edu deka li1619 this is my project okay you can see a blue check mark okay so a project in gcp is basically uh, where you create all your vms networks clusters disk storage everything everything is in a project so if you have worked on gcp you might have seen projects already okay 
like in production environment we create a production project for development we create a development project all the development machines belong to development project all the production machines belong to production project now this is my project this is the name of my project and first of all i have set this project over there g cloud config set project okay after setting the project i have enabled the computing service okay you have to enable it g cloud enable service enable compute dot google apis after that i have enabled the container services kubernetes services because by default services are not enabled if you have used gcp already services will be enabled if you are using gcp for the first time you need to go and enable these services you can do it from the ui or you can do it from the command line okay after that set the region in which region you want to create the cluster so g cloud config set computing region after that in that region there will be multiple data centers so which particular data center so this is the data center zone okay so you have to set a region in that region you have to select a zone in which zone you want to uh, create the cluster and after that is done you simply have to run one simple command that is g cloud container clusters create that's it this is the command to create a cluster it will this for this command to complete it will take around a few minutes four to five minutes it will take around five minutes so just stay patient this will create your cluster with a two node with two machines okay and the name of the cluster is hello cluster you can give any name production cluster testing cluster poc cluster uat cluster whatever you want to do you can give the name okay it's it's up to your wish but this is the command g cloud container the clusters create name of the cluster and how many nodes you want to do that's it you hit enter it will start creating it up that's it now once the cluster is created okay i'm not going to do this again i have already created this okay just to save my time i have pre-created the cluster and you can see the kubectl get nodes kubectl is the command line utility to interact with kubernetes like i want to interact with kubernetes so kube cuttle you call it as kube cuttle you call it as kubectl one and the same thing kubectl get me the nodes hit enter and you will see that i have a two node cluster over there you can see that and both the nodes are running from last 44 minutes last 44 minutes i am running this cluster I told you I have before just before the, at the beginning of the webinar I created this. Okay, so this is the age of my cluster. Okay, and you want to see if I am running any application. What is the version of Kubernetes that I am running? I am running version one twenty four dot nine. Basically, it's one dot twenty four. This is the patched version. Dot nine dash gke dot thirty two hundred. This is the patch, but the actual version of Kubernetes that I am running is version one dot twenty four. 1.26 is the latest release of Kubernetes. Okay, Kubernetes started in 2013 with release 1.0. And till today, we have 26 releases of Kubernetes in place. The latest one is 1.26. Okay, now let's see if I'm running any application, if I'm running any pod over there. So kubectl get me the pod. If I'm running something, no, I don't, I'm not running anything. I'm not running anything. You can see that kubectl get pod. Let's go and execute one. Okay, let's go and create one application. So I can do that. So kubectl uh, run my, I give an email, my first pod. I want to run a pod, my first pod. And after that, I need to run a container nginx. So I'm passing the image. Like in this pod, I'm going to run a container and that container should be a nginx container. So I'm simply running a command kubectl run the name of the pod and then the passing the image. That's it. And this will start creating it up. Let's hit enter. It says pod created kubectl get me the pod. Okay. So it says container creating. The pod is created in the pod. It is creating the container. You can see zero by one. Zero by one means right now there is total one container in the pod. Total number of containers in the pod. And how many are running? Zero means the first means how many are running. Okay, so zero is running out of one. Let's see the output one more time. Okay, let's see it one more time over there. Let's go back. kubectl get me the pod. And it is running now one by one. And you can see the age 33 seconds. You want to check the pod? Okay, you want to check the pod? So kubectl describe the pod. And the name of the pod is my first pod and you will see some events coming up here okay see 
successfully assign the pod to this node. This is a node, guys. See this. This node I am running over there. I have two node cluster. So pod will be running on a node. Okay, see this. Which node it is running? It is running on five F X B. Five F X B. See this. The pod pod is actually a container only. Okay, it is running on this machine. Okay, let's check it. Kubectl get nodes. How many nodes I have? See, I have two nodes. So the container started on this node. Okay, pulling image after it was assigned to this node, it started pulling the image. Okay, once the image is pulled up, successfully pulled the image in 5.5 seconds, it says created container and then started the container. Okay, so these are some of the events that you can see over here. Okay, you can see all these events over here. Okay. And if I scroll it up, you can see this is the name of the pod. Okay, this is the IP of the pod. Okay, and this this IP, the IP of the pod is coming from that network, the cluster network, which is created by Kubernetes. When you deploy a Kubernetes cluster, it creates that network. I'm using GKE. I'm using Kubernetes engine, a Kubernetes as a service. So that's why just one command in my cluster is created, just one command, nothing more than that. Why? Because Google is creating the cluster for you. Google is managing everything for you. Google is telling you, Hey, you tell me, I will manage the cluster for you. You just concentrate on your applications. That's it. This is what your, uh, uh, Google is doing. I'm just focusing on my application. This IP is coming from that network, the container network, which is deployed and you can see. I have created the container. The container is not a Docker container. Kubernetes has a facility. Kubernetes not Kubernetes can work with any container tool. It can work with Docker. It can, there are a lot many container tools available in the market as well. Okay. Like if I, if I talk about only container tools, okay. Container, container tools. Sorry. Then we have a lot many tools here as well. Like Docker is one of the tool. We have container D, we have cryo, we have podman. We have a lot many container tools available in the market. Okay. Now Kubernetes can work with any of the container tool. That's for sure. It can use any container tool over there, any container tool. Okay. And in case of GKE, it is using container D. If you have worked with OpenShift, OpenShift uses Cryo. These are container tools. So Kubernetes is not restricted to Docker itself. But yes, we normally try to run, we normally try to use Docker because Docker is one of the very popular container engine. The old Docker is not the oldest, but yes, Docker is one of the popular, one of the open source container tool. Okay. So, but yes. Kubernetes can use any of these container tool. And that is what it is using here. You can see it up here. It is created a container D tool. It is using container D as a container tool. Kubernetes manages containers and for managing containers, you require a container runtime environment. You require a container tool. So that is what it is used here. Container D. The image is nginx and the image is pulled from Docker Hub. So all the images that are sitting on Docker Hub can work with Docker, can work with ContainerD, can work with Cryo. So Docker images are universal. Those images can be used by any container tool. Okay. So images have no issues, but yes, tools can be different. Same images can be used by any of the tool, any of the container tool. It can be used by Docker. It can be used by ContainerD. It can be used by Cryo. It can be used by Podman. Does not matter. So images, no issues. But yes, we have different, different container tools, which have some different, different features. And out of those container tools, almost most of them can be used with Kubernetes. And you can see container D is used here. Okay. And this is what my container is running. And you can see the events for that. You can see the container, the like kubectl get the pod. Okay. I can expose this pod as well. I can expose this pod like kubectl. If I want to expose the pod, I want to expose this pod. My first pod 
and I can expose it using the type of service as a load balancer. I can use a load balancer to expose this load balancer. The load balancer is basically a service in Kubernetes that is used to expose the ports and the application. I want to expose it on port 80 minus minus target minus port also as 80. And I want to name the service as test service. Okay. Or first service. I'm creating the service to expose it. And I can do that. Okay. You can see it is exposed. kubectl get the service. And see the service got created. It will get an IP. And using this IP, I can access the port. I can access the application. And in the backend, if you go and see, I have a load balancer getting created. So I'm basically using a load balancer to expose my application into Kubernetes to the outside world. Let me first show you that. See, I go to network. I go to this load balancing network services, load balancing. Okay. And you will see that a load balancer is getting created over here. Okay. See this loading contents and see this load balancer and check the IP of this load balancer. Okay. See the IP 35236104239. Same IP is assigned over there. See this. This was pending. Now see the IP. Now I just need to copy this IP and put it over there. That's it. I'm able to access my application. Guys, any one of you can access this application from your mobile phones or from your laptop. Whether you have joined, just put this IP on your web browsers and you will be able to access the application that I've deployed on my Kubernetes cluster. Okay. So this is the beauty of Kubernetes. It manages the container, it provides high availability, fault tolerance, scalability. All these are the features of Kubernetes. And that is why we use orchestrators day in and day out for deploying containerized applications. Docker is also a powerful tool, but the problem with Docker is that it's a single point of failure and a non-scalable solution. Okay. But yes, with Kubernetes, you can see, you can get all the features that you want. Scalability, high availability, fault tolerance, everything. Okay. And you can get these services. You can use services to expose your application. Like I have did like this. You can use load balancer to expose your application. Load balancer is basically a type of service in Kubernetes. Okay. So guys, that's it in this uh, webinar from my end. Hopefully everyone liked it. Thank you guys. Bye-bye.